I am building and weathering this cool old barn kit from Showcase Miniatures as I get started on a farm scene for my layout on Ron's Trains and Things right now. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and I have been planning a farm scene for the upper deck of my layout for quite some time. Now, I grew up on a farm, and where the farm meets the rails has always been an important part of my model railroading experience. Well, today I am starting that farm scene, and I'm going to begin by giving you an overview of where it is on the layout, what it's going to include, and I'm going to build the first structure for that farm scene today. It is a Showcase Miniatures wood kit of an old barn, and it is a beautiful kit. It's also very, very detailed, so it's very delicate and in scale, but I'm going to show you all of that as I go along. So first, let's head over to the layout, take a look at where this farm scene is going to be. This video is brought to you by Midwest Model Railroad. Now with 15,000 square feet and one day shipping, they truly are your one-stop model railroad shop. MidwestModelRR.com, link in the description. For context, this is the North Texas scenery that I built for video about a year prior to this video. It's adjacent to the farm scene that I'm going to build. Here, you can see down the upper deck towards the curve in the layout. This is all North Texas, and just past the curve is where this farm scene is going to be. Here you see up close that I still need to glue down then shape the final layer of foam base but I want to build a couple of the structures for reference before I do. The farm will include these two structure kits, a farmhouse by RS Laser Kits and Deloney's Barn by Showcase Miniatures, which I'm going to build today. The farm will also include a cornfield using two sets of Blueford Shop's cornfield corn stalks. I know that corn is not really that common in this part of North Texas, but this is just an element that I want to include as it's an important part of my background and how I envision a farm scene that I want to build. So I'm taking some modeler's license and adding it in. So with that introduction, let's get started on the barn. This kit is comprised of laser cut wood with heavy etched paper roof and a handful of metal barrels. It includes excellent instructions with detailed illustrations. The interior structure is cut from hardboard stock, while the visible walls are cut from modeling grade wood. Always take time to start by making sure that all of the parts that should be included are there in the kit and you're ready to go. This kit build begins by assembling the internal structure of the barn. Now, I'm going to say from the outset that these internal stud walls are extremely fine and delicate, which adds to the realism and the detail of the final structure, but it also makes them extremely fragile. In fact, I broke internal parts of this structure twice while building the barn, but fortunately I was able to glue the parts back together in good shape. I began by identifying the correct internal pieces and cutting them from the carrier sheets. The location where each of these parts fits into the kit is very specific, so make sure you, that you have the correct part in the correct location and orientation. At this early stage, the barn appears rather flimsy, but it'll become much more strong and rigid as construction continues. Also, some of the parts were warped a bit out of the box. There's no sense in complaining about this, this extremely thin wood is just very susceptible to changes in temperature and in humidity, and it will warp. I've had this kit on hand for over a year, so I wasn't shocked to see this warpage. I was able to work the bows and twists out of the wood kit as I built the kit. To assemble the kit, I used Carpenter's wood glue. You could also use simple white PVA or Elmer's glue, or even canopy glue for this. Personally, I prefer wood glue for wood kits because it is formulated specifically for wood-to-wood -wood applications. I pour a drop of glue into a bottle lid and apply it with the handle of a used micro brush with the brush twisted off. This handle makes a great fine applicator so you don't get too much glue in any of these fine in-scale joints. 
Step one joins three interior walls with one end wall and the ceiling over the loafing shed. In many of these steps, I use extra glue applied to interior parts that will not show on the finished model to strengthen the joints. A couple of one, two, three blocks helps hold everything together and keep it square while the glue tacks. These are absolutely a must have tool if you do any structure building at all to keep things square while you're working. They also make great weights and help you hold things together while glue dries. If you don't have a set of one, two, three blocks, I highly recommend them and I will link them in my Amazon pick of the week in the description below this video if you'd like to check some out. I also use modified tiny decorative clothes pins which make great clamps for tiny delicate parts. I'll link those in the pick of the week as well. After the first end wall and ceiling had mostly dried, I installed the opposite wall in much the same way. I had to hold these pieces together for a few minutes to pull the bow out of these interior wall sections. At this stage, the walls were in a bit of a twist due to the bowed parts out of the package, but I was able to fix this in the next step. Once those interior walls had dried for about an hour, I began installing the roof support panels. This is not the final visible roof, but rather the sheathing under the roof or subroof, if you will and also the nail tie ends that are visible under the eaves of the roof on the finished model. These panels must go in the correct order as they are different sizes. I worked from the peak of the roof down one side first. I worked to get each panel square on the structure as I glued the roof panels on. Some of the tabs on the interior walls did not line up perfectly at first, so I glued the roof panel to two of the walls let it dry, then force the third wall into place. This helped to square up and even out the twist in the structure. The top of these panels will not show, so I shored up the glue joints at the tabs with some extra glue from the top, as well as inside along each wall section. Again, some small clothespin clamps are very helpful in this step. I took my time and patiently glued each panel in place until the entire subroof was installed. It was in this process that I managed my most damaging break of the model. But here you can see that I easily glued the broken studs back into place. And since these internal studs mostly do not show, none of the damage shows on the finished model. I should also say that the roof sheathing did pull the whole structure back into square. After those parts had dried, I glued in these roof supports and the set of support posts and beam on each end of the barn. The loafing shed on one end has this exterior wall framing for its interior wall. I installed it at this point. Then it was time to install the front and rear exterior wall panels. I cut each panel from the carrier sheet, cut the loft door frame from its carrier sheet, and glued it into the wall panel, and then glued the exterior wall panel to the interior wall frame. There were also doors for these loft openings, and I installed the door on one side, but not on the other. Note that there are several sections of exterior walls with missing boards. I was careful not to put glue on the studs that would be exposed by these missing boards. I was also careful to make sure that I applied glue to all of the edges of the stud wall so as to avoid a loose edge of the wall. Once the glue was applied, I pressed the exterior wall onto the interior framing and clamped them together with clothespin clamps. I want to note here that I had already decided which way I wanted this barn to face on the layout, and the rear wall will not show. So from this point on, I worked each step from the back wall first. I want the back wall to look good in case I ever move the model, but I prefer to practice each step on the wall that is least likely to be seen before performing it on the front wall that will definitely be seen. 
I repeated the same process to install the front exterior wall panel. After the panels were installed, I added some more dots of glue to the interior where I wasn't sure how well the exterior adhered to the framing. Again, this glue will never be seen. Let me pause here to say that if you're enjoying this video and want to see more Model Railroad tips, tools, and techniques, be sure to subscribe down below this video and click the little bell icon so you can catch future videos. I allowed all of the glue to dry completely at this point. Then, after removing the clamps, I began installing the simulated metal roof panels. These are heavy paper stock with self-adhesive backing. Like the subroof, be careful to get the panels in the right location. They are different sizes, and the edges that are intended to be at the bottom have slight variations along the edge to simulate roofing that was installed not quite perfectly. It's important to make sure that the side edges line up all along the front and rear walls. After the panels are installed, install the ridge piece by bending it down the middle and adhering it to the roof panels. I trimmed the excess length with small scissors after installing the ridge. The kit comes with a number of fence panels and a few gates. I installed one of the gates to the front entrance of the loafing shed. I haven't decided how I want to use the other fence panels yet, but I'm sure they will be part of the final farm scene. I painted the roof a base color of Vallejo Model Air number 71.065 steel. I painted using downward strokes, trying to keep a consistent look to simulate galvanized steel roofing. I also painted the visible underside of the roof along the overhang on all four sides. Next, it was time to start staining and weathering the wood. For this, I used Hunter Line weathering stains, starting with a medium brown. I applied a light coat as evenly as possible to one side of the barn. I could tell that this coat wasn't going to be enough, so I immediately applied a second coat. I also applied it to the ceiling of the loafing shed and both end walls. After just a short time, I applied a light gray wash from Hunterline over the brown, paying extra attention to certain boards to differentiate them and give an uneven weathering appearance. I used a sharp hobby knife point to scratch out and wear some of the boards where they butt together to give it a worn wood look. I also broke one siding board intentionally and glued it hanging on the wall. I like this little detail on the front of the barn. When the base coat on the roof was dry, I wanted to provide some weathering for the roof. I used a sharp hobby knife to cut between some of the sheets of simulated metal along the ends. I then bent some of the corners and ends of the roof up and down to simulate damage and wear and tear. I also used the blunt side of the knife to dent the metal along the edges on the front in a few places. I scraped up into the paper along some of the simulated metal ends to create some bends and wear in the middle of the roof as well. All of this damage that I caused, I then came back and bent back towards its original form to tone down the damage a little, leaving just a bit of wear and a few bends across the metal roof. Then it was time to weather the roof. For this, I used Monroe Models Scenery Solution Washes. I began with Dark Earth. Now these are alcohol-based products and are very easy to use. I shook the bottle well, then applied a moderate coat to the roof. I then used clean isopropyl alcohol to wash the excess down the roof until I was happy with the look. This is the first of two colors that I'll use on the roof to be followed by a lighter rust. So I didn't want to overdo it with this stage. The idea at this point was just to create a general grimy look and to make the seams of the roof stand out. 
I allowed the first coat of weathering to dry for a couple hours and then applied a terracotta colored wash to simulate rust. I applied it in much the same fashion, applying a generous coat then washing it down with IPA. I intentionally allowed a little of the wash to pool near the bottom edge of the roof. This part of the roof is flatter and these areas will tend to have more water pool up and will rust more. When the roof was dry, I continued adding layers of stain to the wood until I liked the color. I intentionally left the areas directly under the overhang a little bit lighter where the eave would partially protect the wood from the weather. When I felt like the color was really close to what I wanted, I lightened and toned down parts of the barn with Monroe Models white weathering powder. The idea here was to gray up parts of the barn. The effect looks pretty stark at first, but after applying the weathering powder, I evened it out with just a touch of the light gray Hunterline wash again. And after that layer of wash had dried, I was really happy with the effect. As I build out this farm scene, I'll be adding more details inside and out, as well as around this barn, which I will share on videos as it happens, and I think it's going to come out looking fantastic. To see more about this farm scene and other model railroad content, check out the links on your screen. Remember to check the description below for my Amazon Pick of the Week, MicroMark discount code, and other great links. And join me on Tuesdays as I bring you even more great model railroad videos, and I'll see you on the next video. Tim, Lizzie?